looks over, nodding. Yep, yep, yep. That means he wants to pray for our service tonight. All right. Thank you, Jesus. For Thank you, Lord. Lord God, that you would just touch this uh, Bible study, God, and that Lord, you would just uh, bring some more power and that you would just touch this this milk cart that's kind of going. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. What were we talking about? Ribs. Ribs. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not just oh, last week. Oh, oh. Anybody remember? Um, uh, we got a reboot here. Um, oh boy. Oh. What were we talking about last week, guys? Hebrews. And we, we said that it was, let's see, it was Hebrews 11. I did use something from Hebrews 11. Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. What was the topic? Yeah, that's what I was yeah. going to say. But well, that's our theme this year. Yeah. Oh. Altars of the Old Testament, remember? Yeah. We talked about uh, oh, yeah. how the altar is a very important part of our surrender to Jesus yes. and his spirit and his word and allowing that to form in our life. Um, and we looked into the altars of Cain and Abel, and we talked about that. And then we talked about Noah when he built an altar to the Lord and how that covenant was there with God. Um, and then I ended with Romans 12 and 1, which says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And hence the altar, need of an altar in our life. If we're going to present our bodies a living sacrifice, we need a place to offer that, and that would be our altar. And... Then he went on to say, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And really what we're talking about is how our repentance and our sacrifice on our altar prepares our hearts to receive what Jesus has for us. Because God's got some great things in store for his people. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? He really does. God's got, uh, the Bible says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord has prepared for them that love him. And so um, just real quick, kind of before we get into this, uh, aside from like our Sunday service where, you know, we come down to the front and we call that the altar area where we respond to the word of God. We respond to how the Lord ministered to us in worship and we, you know, uh, find a place to pray down there. What would an, what could an altar look like? In our in our life, on a normal basis, aside from church, it's your steering wheel. Could, could be your steering it. wheel. Oh, you know, could be. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. Don't close your eyes when you're praying and driving, though. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I didn't mean when you're driving. I meant when, when you're parked or. Yeah, you or know. even if you were yeah. driving, you know. I mean, I'm sure that you know. I've heard many testimonies and have prayed many times while driving. Um, yeah, it could be your steering wheel. What else? Anywhere in your home. Anywhere in your own house for your kids. Yeah, you can build an altar. Conference yeah. Room What's that? For a conference room at work. Conference room. Your desk at work. Your desk uh, for those that are in school. Your desk at school. Your your bedside. Uh, I think it's just, in, you know, the most important thing is that we have a place where we can offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, right? Um, where we can worship him, a time where we can praise him and enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, where we can get into the word of God and meditate on it and say, Lord, I, I want this word to, to minister to me today. Help me to understand what I'm reading and how can I apply what I'm reading into my life so I can be more like you. Um, an altar or altars in our life they really represent the place or the situation or occasion where we had an encounter with Jesus, right? I mean, probably, somebody could probably remember the place where they had an altar and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. For Scott, it was in the center section of the sanctuary in Shawano, Wisconsin at July 4th. family camp on no. July 4th, right? No. Never forget that. Uh, my altar when I received the Holy Ghost was in the basement of the parsonage at the, when we were in the old church yet uh, with me and me and my pastor praying and I received the Holy Ghost. 
Where was your altar when you received the Holy Ghost? I can kind of come in in the roof um, sanctuary. Yeah. Stockton, California. Hmm. Charlie? The altar at home is just a broken. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Derek, you were at camp, weren't you? Uh, family camp. Family camp. Yeah. yeah. Children's church or just a camp service? Children's oh, wow. church. Yeah. How old were you when that? Oh, jeez. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Ethan, too, up there, about the same age. Yeah. Dallas, you remember? Midwinter camp? Mm -hmm. In Oak Creek? Yeah. Remember how old you were? Yeah. Ten. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Where'd mm. Caitlin get the Holy Ghost at? The church yeah. here, I think, yeah. Mm. yeah. Tim and Vicky, you remember? Yep, front row, right hand side, A, B, C. After everybody left, I, well, that was with Pastor Gillum. Okay. So he said something to me like, what can I do for you or something? And I said, I just feel like I need to stay here and pray. And we hardly knew each other. So and Pastor Gillum and Brian, that's his son, was still there. And we said, well, Brian, come on over here. Let's let's pray for this sister. That's how we kind of talked. And um, I said, well, I really want the Holy Ghost. And he said, well, we can pray for that. And he says, what do you think hinders you? And I said, every time I pray for the Holy Ghost, I just see a brick wall in front of my face. And he said, we're going to rebuke that brick wall. And as soon as him and Brian rebuked it, I started speaking in tongues. Wow. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old I was. Mm -hmm. It was pretty common. Yeah. <coughs> so, just a couple years ago. <laughs> so I was 26. I could have been 26. Wow. Yeah. Tim, do you remember? Probably. Don't remember the exact time? Gotcha. I think you were over at um, a service at the lake, weren't you? And that church, I went to that Peace Church. Yeah. We're all praying for you. Hmm. Yeah, I don't remember the day, the date. I don't remember at all the year. I can guess about what year it was, you know, but I definitely remember where I was and the conversation and the prayer time. And yeah, so. I'll never forget mine. Right, it's it's a it, powerful time, you know, um, especially you know when you, when you're younger. Now, Derek, in another thirty years, you might say, "Oh, I kind of remember," you know, it's, you're pretty young, but you remember the other altars since then, and altars they're all significant in our life. Um, you know, when when you come in and you're you know twenty or when you're a little past twenty, no, you, you know, and you receive the Holy <laughs> Ghost. That's it, it it's it's a little different than when I'm sure than when you receive it as a as a child, you know. Um, so, when we have that encounter with Jesus and we we built that altar, and He shows up, it's just an incredible time. And and that's not just for the re receiving of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's for any, it's for every day, right? Every day in our life to have an altar. Um, for many days, for us, it's sitting in the chairs in the living room drinking coffee and having worship music going on. I usually let her go ahead and get started first so she'll have the coffee all done when I get out there. <laughs> um, except on Sundays. On Sundays, I'm normally out there first. But, um, yeah, we just we have that relationship with God. Or maybe it's you, you come here to the church. I can remember... Um, it's been a few years back, but we used to have some 72-hour prayer meetings mm -hmm. and where we would have people sign up for two-hour shifts, and you would come, and the door would always be open. So mm -hmm. you're hoping that if you're in the middle of the night or early morning that the, the next person was coming because you were going to leave you know, mm -hmm. the building. Um, but, yeah, come and pray for two hours, and the next person comes in and oh, wow. prays for two hours, and we had continual prayer for 72 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, so we talked about those individuals. Now, after Noah, who do we think is the next person in the Old Testament that we're going to see building an altar? Mm. Noah ends in Genesis 11. 
roughly yeah. with the genealogy. So who would who who do we start talking about in Genesis twelve? Abraham. Abraham. Yeah. We're about right there in our Bible study. I think that's about where we're we left off right last. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, we're past. We're all the way through our offering to Isaac, right? Um. So Genesis twelve and one. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, this is before his name was changed, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from your father's house, unto a land that I will show you. The Bible says Abraham, his dad, and his grandfather, they are from the land of Ur of the Chaldees, or the Chaldeans. Um, but what we sometimes miss is that, and, and I'm, I'm curious a little bit into the story, uh, because Terah packed up his family and they left Ur of the Chaldees. He took, Terah took his sons, Nahor and Haran and Abram, and they left to go to the land of Canaan. That's where they were headed. But then they stopped in a city called Haran, named after, not named after a son, I don't believe, but the, the same name as his son. And they, uh, Haran died there. That was Lot's father. And they ended up staying there until Terah died. And then God called Abram, out of Haran to go to the land of Canaan. Um, Genesis 11 and 31 says they ended up staying in Haran, and that's where God called Abram. And so when he called him there in Genesis 12 and 1, it says in verse 6 that Abram passed through the land unto a place of Shechem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was in the land then, so they weren't driven out yet. And so when it says he went to the place of Sechem, Sechem means ridge, and it's the same as the neck or between the shoulders, as the place of burdens. And I, I just think that's interesting that he came through Sechem, the place of burdens, and then he came to the plain of Mora, which uh, the plain means kind of there's a grove of oaks or a hill with oaks on it. And... Mora means archer or teaching early rain. So kind of like to flow as water, to go forth as water. And there's even indication, and sometimes it's hard because they use very similar words. So in the translations, it's kind of challenging to find out exactly what the places mean. But there is significance a lot of times in the names of locations or things that they did, especially if they named them. Uh, if you go through when Leah was naming her children, uh, she named them their names for reasons. The first three, uh, she chose their names because she was trying to get her husband's attention. Mm. She was trying to get Jacob's attention. And then finally, when she had Judah, she says, now I'm just going to praise God. You know? Uh, when Isaac was building altars, uh, not altars, when he was digging wells, he named all the different wells, and Abraham had dug some of them wells, and so each well had a different name, and it meant something. So it says then that um, he went through the, the plain of Morah, and it says in verse 7, The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. And so then it says, There he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So the first account of Abram building an altar, his first altar was in the plain of Morah, and that's where God appeared to him. And so what, what is so significant from the, just the verse that we read, what's so significant about this altar? The first one? It's, it's the first one. <clears throat> what did the name Morah Mora mean again? Morah means... Um, it's like a grove of oaks is the plain, and then it means archer teaching um, or early rain. So they do think that because of the person it was named after, like there might have been a place that might have been where people gathered together because it was more, more or less a, a mound, and sometimes they would use landmarks like that. Um, in fact, because Abraham started going to places like that, he would build a grove. But then later on, God says, I don't want you going up to high places. I don't want you building groves. Because they were too closely identified with idols and pagan worship. So we have to realize for a time, God allowed people to approach him. But then when he gave his law, he says, okay, this is how I want you to approach me. This is what I'm looking for. 
So just because Abraham did it once doesn't mean, oh, it's okay. It means that God was bringing him from the lifestyle. It's all a journey, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he said, come out from among your family. Why did he have to leave them? Well, to get away from that influence so God could uh, change his heart and change his mind and build him into the man that he wanted him to be. Um, so it was his first altar, but it was it was really where God first gave him the promise, right? He said, um, unto your seed will I give this land. And so he says, you're in the land of Canaan. I'm going to give you and, and your children this land. And so he says, well, if God is going to make a promise unto me, then I want something to kind of, it's a type of a covenant, really. And so when God gives us promises in his word, and we receive those promises and say, I want this promise of God in my life. I want this part of his word in my life. Uh, not that we pick and choose different parts, but when we're reading, when God is ministering to us or we're being preached to or ministered to, and we hear that word, we hear that message, and we say, I want that. This is ministering to me. I want that. So what do we do? We go down to the altar because this is where we're making a covenant with God about his word in our life. And that's what Abraham was doing. There's something special about the place that God calls you, right? Or makes a promise in your life. Um, I know that sometimes it's, you know, it's, I will probably, unless somebody I know buys the house and I can go in and visit, I will probably never again be in the basement of that house, you know. But if I were to go back, it would bring back memories of praying there and receiving the Holy Ghost. Uh, going back up to camp. Yeah. It's not something you do every week or yeah. every month. It's a couple times a year, right? But I can promise you the next time you go back, it's going to be sentimental when you walk by that spot oh, sure. where God filled you with the Holy Ghost and where you had an altar and you were reaching out to him and felt his presence. So there's something special about that, that interaction with God and where we build an altar. Um, it says then in verse 8 that Abraham removed from there and went into a mountain on the east of Bethel. Anybody know what Bethel means? Hmm? House of God. Good job. And there he, he put up his tent and he had Bethel on the west and Hai, or it's kind of like Ai. It's the same city, I believe. On the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So this is the second altar Abram is mentioned building. And as Vicki rightly said, Bethel means house of God. It's interesting when I was doing this study, um, because of course this is before Israel is delivered out of Egypt. This is before they're a great nation. This is just Abraham who God started with, and he, he placed his... A dwelling place between the house of God and Hai. You know what Hai means? Heap of ruins. <laughs> and that's what it became after Israel uh, got done there. Um, so as Abram traveled through the land, he built altars, which he likely sacrificed on unto God. Why did he do that? Because God ministered to him. Hmm? So he should have built one before he went into Egypt. He should have built one because that did not go well, right? <laughs> um, after he returned from Egypt, he returned to the location of the altar at Bethel and called again upon the name of the Lord. And after Lot separated from him, they, remember the story? Uh, they got Their substance got too big for the land to take care of them. Yeah. And Abram said, whatever way you choose, I'll go the opposite way. So they separated, and at that point, Abram built another altar. And it says in Genesis 13 and 14, The Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him. It's kind of like a process that God was dealing with Abraham, and he was not forcing him in any way, was he? He was allowing Abraham just to kind of go through the steps, go through the process. And we always think, oh, man, he's 75 when he started. And 
God better speed things up a little bit, right? God's never in a hurry. God, it's all about. There's nothing too hard for him, right? Right. Um. So after Lot was separated, he says, "Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward." And then he says, "For all the land which you see, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed." forever so now it's the promise is a little different now because before he said all the land that you see i'm going to give it to you and your seed which could indicate one generation then after that who knows where but he said now i'm going to give it to you and to your seed forever it's always going to be yours we're still in forever right that's right and israel is still where it's they, they began where God started them. He says, And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise and walk through the land, the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And then Abraham removed his tent and quelt, came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar of the Lord. So now when God again reestablishes the covenant, and now Abram is getting a little bit closer, more and more closer in his relationship with God. He's now separated himself from Lot. He builds another altar. Um, so this time, as he builds this altar, it really shows us that his faith encouraged him to remain faithful and obedient to God while understanding that the promise would not come in his lifetime. You kind of get that through. We'll, we'll read uh, again in, in Hebrews uh, before we finish up. But I really believe that Abraham understood and knew that this promise of this land to him, to his descendants forever, was probably not going to come in his lifetime. So how hard would it be not just to believe God that he could do something, but to remain obedient to God yeah. while he was doing it, knowing that you were not going to partake of it. Right. You know, Scott, God gives you a promise. He gives you a word that's going to come to pass in the days of your daughter's grandchildren. Yeah. But it's up to you to remain obedient so that they can receive it. Think about that for a minute. How challenging would that be? Mm -hmm. To what's that? Yeah, it would be. You know, because you're you're not going to reap from the, yeah. the the fruit of it all, right? But that's where his relationship with God was, and that's why he built the altar. He says, "God, I'm believing this. I'm taking this at your word. I'm establishing this covenant with you, God." And so he would build an altar. He would sacrifice. He would pray and seek God and that faith encouraged him and uh, even though he wasn't going to receive it in his lifetime and then the last and maybe most important altar that Abraham built was this one in Genesis 22 and 1 the last one that the Bible mentions it says it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham now his name has changed right Isaac has been born he's growing up They've gone through the whole Ishmael ordeal. And God said to him, said, called his name, and he says, here I am. And so God says, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I should tell thee of. Now, he knew what a burnt offering was. He knew how you prepared a burnt offering. You... You killed the sacrifice. You separated it. You cut it up. You pulled out the inside parts. And then you burnt it on an altar. So, it says that as they came to the place which God had told them of, Abram built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, and laid him upon the altar upon the wood. 
It tells us earlier that he leaves his servants behind and he traveled for three more days. He saw the place off in the distance and you guys set up camp here. The lad and I are going yonder to worship and will return again to you. And that's the first place we find the word worship. So he says, we're going to go up there. If we're going to worship, we will be back. And that might have been a long three days. Um, so we know the story, right, of what's going to happen. So before we get into that and what happens next, just think about why this could be the most important altar that he ever built, the one he's going to sacrifice his son on. Why would, could, I mean, you'd think well, that. Sacrificing the promise. Hmm? He was sacrificing the promise. Right, because he was, sacri- he was killing the very, promise. the very promise. He only had one son. Through Isaac, your seed shall be called, he said. Mm-hmm. Not Ishmael, not Eleazar of his household. Through Isaac. So why could this be the most important altar he ever built? You'd think that this would be the one he wouldn't want to build. Or the one he'd want to forget and never think of again. But think about what was truly being sacrificed to God. What was really being turned over to God. All of Abraham's power. His, his, his everything. His everything. Yeah. I mean, the future promise, like Sharon said, the, the, the promise was being sacrificed. His future, his whole life, everything he loved and held dear. And the generations that, he said, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That's why it was so important that he did it. I mean, think about that for a minute. What what does it look like to truly give your entire life, everything that you hold dear, over to God and say, here it is, and offer it to him on the second. And I'm not talking about like offering a sacrifice, but I mean spiritually now in our life surrendering all that we have trusting god that much that we say here it is it's in your hands so he's he's going to raise the knife and he's going to uh kill his son divide him up as a sacrifice separate out all the organs take out the inward parts the 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 whole gi track was unclean so you couldn't sacrifice that part you'd have to pull all that out it talks in the bible about offering the kidneys and the liver and the heart and all that stuff separating it all out and so he's getting ready to do that and then the angel of the lord stops him he lifts up his eyes and he looks and behold him a ram caught in a thicket by the horns and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son and right before that Isaac says dad we've got the altar we've got the wood we've got the the fire where's the sacrifice and what did he respond do you remember God will provide himself and he even said a lamb for the sacrifice and of course that's very symbolic of Jesus Christ for our sins in the New Testament. So he sees the ram, he takes the ram, offers it up, and Abram called the name of that place Jehovah Yira, as it is said unto this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and the seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So God made the promise before, right? But it didn't really come into a contract covenant, because that's what a covenant is. A covenant's a contract binding agreement until until this point until abraham was willing to bring his part to the deal right and say i'm willing to do that and god said because you trusted me with this now this is what i'm going to do um 
we would love it if God would just not make us go through the hard part, right? But that wouldn't be faith. If we just went through and did it expecting, you know, oh, I can live for God because I've already got the, the thing here. He does help us in the New Testament. The Bible says the Holy Ghost is the earnest of our inheritance. So it's kind of like we get a portion to help us through to live for God until until the re- redeeming of the, the possession. So, Jehovah Yira, or as we sometimes say in our uh, pronunciation, Jehovah Jira. I know a lot of times that's um, communicated as the Lord who provides. We sing that song, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. But it means, Jehovah Yira means the Lord will see to it. You put it in his hands, he'll take care of it. The Lord appeared to him, and he saw it, and he says, I'll take care of it. He did provide. Provide the lamb. But it means the Lord will see to it. So that's that faith. And this is the altar where Abraham truly offered everything he had, all that he was or ever could be to God. And as he placed his entire life and future on the altar, he said the Lord will see to it. So I think that that's what God wants us to do, is just put our entire life, all that we have, on that altar and say, here it is, God, I trust you with it. You'll see to it. You'll do as you see fit. Um, Hebrews eleven seventeen says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So he says, this is going to happen through Isaac. And then he says, so give me Isaac. And so he, he offers him up, of whom it said that in Isaac thy seed shall be called. And then it says in verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he also received him in a figure. And what that means is he was already dead. He had already made this decision. He was already dead to him. There was no turning back. He was, already, you know, not saying he had already mourned. I don't know what that would have been like. But but it was already done in his heart, and that's why God could stop him. Because God sees the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so when you think about that, now if we think about um, somebody, um, Maybe they, they took a bad spill and they fell and they lost their life. And we think, well, God could raise them up. Or we, somebody gets sick and they die. God can raise them up. You know, we know God can raise the dead. We believe that. So, or somebody was, you know, suffered a, a bad injury. God could raise them back from the dead. But what about, what about somebody that was, and I'm not trying to be grotesque here, but somebody that was offered as a sacrifice to the point where everything was separated, cut up, and then burned. He knew, he believed God could still, there was no, no point that he could go to that God was not able to see to it, right? That affects our faith, though, doesn't it? I mean, we see yeah. once, well, God can do that. Uh, I don't know about that, you know? It, it takes more faith for us. And his faith was at the point where it doesn't matter what happens, God will see to it. Yeah, yep. In the in the book of Ezekiel, yep. Son of man, what do you see? He says, "I lo, there was a valley full of bones, and they were very dry. And so, speak to the bones; they start shaking. All the bones come together, and then all of a sudden, sinew and flesh and muscle and joints are brought together and stand up an exceeding army. But there's no breath in them. So prophesy to the four winds, and the four winds came, and there's an exceeding army standing before him. Yeah, great analogy." Um, so if Christ is going to be formed in our lives, then we have to have an, we have to have altars in our life. We have to have a place and it might be different. It might be behind the steering wheel of your vehicle. It might be in your bedroom beside your bedside at night. It might be in your living room, at your couch, at the church, wherever it might be. But we have to have a place where we're continually offering to God us, our life. Hebrews 13 and 15 says, By him, speaking of Jesus, let us therefore offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. 
So the altar represents our faith in Jesus Christ. Um, again, that's why we really encourage that after the worship or after the praise or during a time of prayer, whenever it is during our services, that we have that opportunity to respond to God and say, God, I want to enter into this covenant with you today. I, I, I can't imagine what it's like, and I used to attend a church, that, you know, th there would be worship, there would be a word of God, and then there was a dismissal with no altar call. No opportunity to go up and say, I want to enter, I want that. To hear such good news, such a great opportunity, and then, and then to leave it there and not do anything with it. That's why the altar is so important. That's why, uh, you know, to, to find that place where you can say, God, I want this. I want you. I want more of you in my life. And we can bring our sacrifice to him, and he responds to our faith and fills our heart. And when we have that experience, our faith is increased, right? When God doesn't, when we trust God in faith and he responds, our, our faith is increased, which causes us to trust him more which pleases him and he responds and then our faith is increased and the Bible says that without faith we can't please him so the more faith the more we trust in him the more he's pleased and so it's kind of like a, a wonderful vicious circle you know it's a continual interaction between us and the Lord so again just wanting to encourage us do we have an altar in our life a place daily of repentance, of worship, of thanksgiving, of saying, God, I want your word to transform and renew my mind. Amen, because I want to be more like you. Any thoughts? I think it's interesting, too, that um, there were times during Israel's travelings where God would tell them, Make an altar, but not out of cut stone. Make it out of un... Uh, I don't remember the term the Bible uses. Un un uncut, yeah. But I, I thought that there was another term. But yeah, basically, unhewed, uncut stone. Mm -hmm. not, um, not messed up with our hands. Not trying to cut it and chisel it, deform it. So it's like bricks and didn't have to be perfect it was just a place where right. where uh people would build that altar and but make a fire when it formed by man's he didn't want our hands in right. it right right sure. yeah so moving forward what are some next altars we're gonna i think we're gonna talk about we're moving past abraham now isaac had some altars jacob David probably had some altars, yeah. Um, I think we'll definitely get to, uh, we'll probably move through Isaac and Jacob together, and then we'll get into uh, where, where I really kind of want to finish this up is just talking about the law of Moses then and kind of where this all comes to and the different altars and offerings and sacrifices that were made uh, unto the Lord and kind of what they meant and what they were for. And then again, how that, how that applies to us today because we're not obviously still killing animals, right? right. Offering them as sacrifices. Thank you, Jesus. None of that, right? Aren't you glad that every Sunday you don't have to bring something here to... <laughs> even once a year. Or even once a year. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the altars that you've given us in our life and the encouragement, God, to trust you and to seek you, God, and the examples of those that have gone before us, God, to encourage us in our faith, to trust you with our life and the promises that you've given us. Lord, I just pray for each and every one of us, your church here in Monroe, God, that you'd help us to build altars in our life, God, to take time to allow your word to form our hearts and our minds, to become more like you, Jesus, and less and less like this world. We thank you, we love you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.